So let's reacquaint ourselves with the setting. I've got you in chapter 19, but go ahead and flip a page backward. Look at chapter 18 and verse 16. Genesis chapter 19. Uh, we'll be in tonight, but flip back to 18 and we'll look at verse 16. It says, The men rose up from thence. If you remember, the two angels and the Lord met with Abraham. Abraham fed them, put them on a big spread for them. They sat under a tree and ate, and he waited on them. And they got up from there, and they looked toward Sodom. And Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. If you look at verse 20, the Lord said, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which is come unto me, and if not, I will know. And the men turned their faces from thence and went toward Sodom, but Abraham stood yet before the Lord. So these men going down to inspect what God heard out of Sodom. And then, of course, from verses 23 through on down to the end of the chapter, you have Abraham because God knew he was in tune with him and was interested in him and would follow him. Abraham had communion with God and was able to influence what God would do in Sodom. And God would have spared the whole city, the whole plain. All these people would have been spared if God found ten righteous people in Sodom, and that was all because of Abraham's communion with God. It's amazing. But then, of course, you get to chapter 19, and we'll see what the angels found. There came two angels to Sodom at even, at dusk, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom, and he got up, he rose up to meet him, he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. In verse 2, he basically said, why don't you turn in for the night and get up early and get out of here? And then they said, no, the end of verse 2, we'll abide in the street all night. They were on God's business to inspect what was going on. And he twisted their arm because he know, knew what was do going on at night and got them to come into his house and he made them a, a skimpy feast of unleavened bread. But before they lay down, the men of Sodom surrounded the house, the old men, the young men, all of them from every part of the city, and they basically demanded of Lot, send out those men that you have as your guests that we might know them. And this was a, a sexual knowledge. They wanted to do wicked things. And, of course, Lot went out and tried to tried diplomacy with them and even somehow offering his two daughters who were virgins to them to do whatever they wanted. And they were basically like, why are you calling us out for wickedness? Because he said in verse 8, please don't do so wickedly. And they said, this immigrant, this sojourner, he wants to be our judge, and we're going to deal worse with thee than with them. And they pressed sore upon Lot. And we're about to break the door. But then, verse 10, the men, they snatched Lot, pulled him in the house, and shut the door, those two men. And they smote the men that were at the door of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they wearied themselves to find the door. And so when Lot was safely inside, it says, The men said unto Lot, Hast thou here any besides? Son-in-law, and thy sons, and thy daughters, and whatsoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place. For we will destroy this place, because the cry of them is waxen great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. And Lot went out, spake unto his sons-in-law, which married his daughters, and said, Up! Get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. And when the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city, in the devastating punishment of the city. But notice verse 16, And while he lingered, the men laid hold upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife, and upon the hand of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful unto him. And they brought him forth and set him without the city. And it came to pass, when they had brought them forth abroad outside of the city, that one of the angels said, Escape for thy life. Look not behind thee. Don't look back. 
Neither stay thou in all the plain, all the plain of Jordan that included all the cities, Sodom, Gomorrah, and all the other cities surrounding that. You can see more about the names of those cities in chapter 14. So don't stay in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. And Lot said unto the one saving his life, Oh, not so, my Lord. Behold now, and this, this almost sounds like, it almost sounds good, but it's not. He says, Behold now, thy servant hath found grace in thy sight, and thou hast magnified thy mercy, which thou hast showed unto me in saving my life. You've been so merciful, so merciful to me, but I can't do what you're asking me to do. I cannot escape to the mountain, lest some evil take me, and I die. As if the place he was leaving, he'd do any better. Behold now, this city is near to flee unto, and it is a little one. Oh, let me escape thither. Is it not a little one? It sounds like a reasoning little child. And my soul shall live. And amazingly, the angel said unto him, See, I have accepted thee concerning this thing also, that I will not overthrow this city for the which thou hast spoken, had planned on overthrowing that city. It was one of the cities of the plain, Zoar was one of the cities of the plain. But then he says in verse 22, Haste thee, hurry, escape thither. That means escape there. I cannot do anything till thou become thither. Therefore the name of the city was, was called Zoar. The sun was risen upon the earth when Lot crossed the city limits and entered into Zoar. Then the Lord reigned upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah, brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and that which grew upon the ground. But his wife, Lot's wife, looked back from behind him and she became a pillar of salt. And Abraham, talk about a change of scene. Abraham got up early in the morning to the place where he stood before the Lord communing with God about Sodom just the day before. And he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain and beheld. And lo, the smoke of the country went up as the smoke of a furnace. And it came to pass when God, watch this, when God destroyed the cities of the plain, that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he, God, overthrew the cities in the which Lot dwelt. It's a sobering account of judgment. And God destroyed a civilization who detested righteousness and ran wild after wickedness. Yet, the one righteous man in the city had to be yanked out lest he face God's fiery judgment with those wicked people. So our message tonight, is the title is this, When God Has to Evict You. When God Has to Evict You. So this is for primarily for believers in Jesus Christ tonight, the righteous people, by faith in Christ, when God has to evict you. There's a great difference between an invitation and an eviction. You think about what an invitation is. You live here, but perhaps you're invited to live there. Or you are here but you're invited to be there. Typically, an invitation is positive. It's a positive thing. And there's excitement, and there's good things with that. Where you are is not as good as where you will be, or not as exciting as where you will be. I think about this in terms of someone uh, receiving an invitation to relocate, because we, we ended our reading and talking about where Lot lived, where he dwelt. And so I think about an invitation in the terms of someone living somewhere and then being invited to live somewhere else. And 
perhaps you can imagine a homeless individual living on an under I-85. For whatever reason, he's there, he's living there, uh, whatever means he has, or maybe he's standing there with a sign, or maybe he lives in the woods. There's some, uh, actually some homeless encampments in, in our uh, county, um, and people, they live there and then make their way about their day and to, to survive in our county, go to different places like Bridging the Gap and and find ways to make it. And so you think about a homeless man like that and imagine a person coming along and me- acquainting themselves with this man and imagine this individual having some wealth, having a place, uh, a, a nice house, and but not just being wealthy in resources, but also being wealthy in soul. And so a man that is wealthy in soul will be diligent and will want to help another individual, but wants to help them learn to help themselves. You've heard the old adage, the adage, give a man a fish, feed him for the day, teach a man to fish, feed him for a lifetime. And so you have an individual who's willing, he sees this man who's in need, he's willing to take him under wing and care for him and, and basically make him a part of the family and whatever we have is, is, is yours. You have an invitation to, to live with us and while you're under, uh, under our wing and with us, we're going to help you move forward in life. That would be quite an invitation for an individual like that, for a man like that to, to move from where he was to where he could be and the limitless potential of where he could be. That reminds me, an invitation like that makes me think of Genesis chapter 12. You don't have to go back there, but where our story with Abraham and Lot began, it began in Abraham when he was living in Ur of the Chaldees, uh, part of his father's house, and that was a land where people worshipped all kinds of different gods, and God spoke to Abraham. The one true God spoke to Abraham and basically said this, if you will leave your country and leave your kindred, your family, and your father's house and go to a land that I will tell thee of, I'm going to bless you and I'm going to multiply you and I'm going to make of you a great nation and you'll be a blessing to others and I'll bless those that bless you and curse those who curse you and all nations of the earth shall be blessed. Talk about an invitation that Abraham had. An invitation is a very powerful thing. And I was not planning on saying this, but if you listen, when you invite somebody to gather with our church, you are you are inviting them to that is an invitation of limitless potential. As they come here and hear the gospel for the first time, be saved, live forever, have a life enriched by you, the people of God. You say, well, that's not very enriching. Well, why don't you start loving people like you should, and then your life would be enriching, but I'm assuming you're already loving people as you should, so we don't have to say that. But anyways, we could all use that. But that is an invitation of limitless potential to invite someone. Okay, so an invitation is a very powerful thing. But there's a great difference between an invitation and an eviction. An eviction is you live here, but you're being evicted. You're being removed, kicked out from here. You are here, but you soon won't belong here and soon won't be here. Evictions are never positive. Where you are is pretty much, where you are when the eviction comes is pretty much better than where am I going to be? I think of that homeless individual and you never know the circumstances that a person experiences to get to that point. You don't know what they experienced and how that totally changed their life and, and, and wrecked their world to, to go to such a place. Now, I want to point out something to us tonight that an eviction is a powerful thing. It's a powerfully negative thing. But when we think about that, Lot was not evicted by Sodom. When we think about this text, Lot wasn't evicted by Sodom. In fact, you read verse 1 of chapter 19 and you see that he was sitting in the gate of Sodom. He had power in Sodom. Economically, he had arrived. He had prestige. Talk about the potential he had. Sodom did not evict him. 
In fact, it wasn't until he betrayed his true colors, who he was on the inside, that he was actually a person kind of concerned about righteousness. When they found out the real him, that's when they didn't want anything to do with him anymore. When they found out he cared a lick about God and the things of God. But when Lot was just going along to get along, Sodom did not want to evict him and, and remove him. And so he wasn't evicted by uh, Sodom. There's a difference between an invitation and an, and an eviction. And frankly, I got the title wrong tonight when God has to evict you because really this has more about when God has to evacuate you than when God has to evict you and there's even a difference you say how far are you going to take this thing I'll just wait there is a difference between an eviction and an evacuation because in an eviction you might think I don't want to go I won't go but an evacuation says leave or die escape and don't look back. It's hurricane season and you live on the coast of Florida and there's a big one rolling in and you pack up what things you need and you load your family up and you get up the interstate as fast as you can or you will pay the price. I think of the people who've lived in areas where there's nuclear exposure. You go now. Otherwise, there'd be long-term consequences, deadly consequences, possibly on your health. Listen, God here was trying to evacuate Lot. Because in verse 12 through, thir- 12 through 13, the angels told him, Hey, if you have any family, uh, extended family, sons-in-law, sons, daughters, whoever you have, Lot, it's your responsibility. Get them out of here. Because God has sent us to destroy this place. God is going to destroy this place. You see again in verse 17, they said, Escape for your life. Don't look back. I said, escape for your life and don't look back. Go to the mountain. Get off of the plane. It was a fire plane, not a flood plane. I said, it was a fire plane. It probably was a flood plane too because it was near the Jordan River. But it was a fire plane and they needed to get out of there. They were in danger. And then again, I believe in verse 19, or let me, let me see there, 22, he said, hurry, hurry, escape there. Go, escape. There's a difference between an eviction and an evacuation. Now I want to point out that God in his mercy evacuated Lot out of Sodom. But Lot fought the evacuation as if it was an eviction. God was in the process of evacuating Lot by his mercy forcibly removing Lot out of Sodom, but Lot fought the evacuation as if it was an eviction. Because you look at verse 15. Lot has been warned the night before. And the morning comes, and it says the first thing when morning comes, guess what? The angels are rushing Lot. They're hastening Lot. Now, I, I, I try to imagine this in my mind. That we know the night before when the angels warned Lot to gather who he had and bring them out of here. The instruction's simple. Go get your people, who will, whoever will come and gather them and just leave. But the morning has come and something happened between last night and this morning. Well, what happened in, chapter, or in verse 14 is Lot went to his sons-in-law the husbands of his daughters, and he tried to warn them about what was coming and tell them to get out of here, but we found out he had no influence on them whatsoever. Absolutely zero influence on them, and they mocked him. They made fun of him. Now, what would that do to a man's ego and self-respect? He's been living with respect by his peers. He's been living with respect in Sodom. But now, when, when, a, when a messenger comes who seems to have the power of God, these angels rescued his life and protected him from the wicked men. When a messenger like that comes, comes on the scene, he's like, well, maybe I got this wrong. Maybe this was all a big misunderstanding. And, and maybe I can, I can hear his wife. Uh, Honey, maybe you are taking this a little too far. I mean, I know that was an incredible thing these two men did last night. But hey, we need to, let's just sleep on this. Can you hear that? Let's just sleep on this and think through. Didn't you see the way the boys, I mean, she's affectionately calling her her daughter's husbands the boys. She loves them. They're part of the family. Don't don't you hear, why don't you just listen to to them for once? I mean, yeah, you sit in the gate of Sodom, but that doesn't mean, uh, look at these nothing. I'm making up words now. Why don't you, why don't you just sit on this and sleep on this until we find they're there the next morning? And the angels are rushing them, hasting them. Hey, get up. 
I almost thought, did they wake Lot up? They said, arise, get your wife, get your daughters who are here, and get out of here, lest you be consumed. Fire consumes. Burns everything in its path. Lest you be consumed in the iniquity of the city. But notice verse 16 again. It says he lingered. He lingered. And whether that was because of his family, or whether that was because he was second-guessing things, or whether it was because he didn't actually want to leave Sodom, he didn't actually believe these men, he lingered there, so much so that the men, they grab onto his hand, and they grab onto the hand of his wife, and they grab onto the hand of his daughters. You say, they're getting a little forceful. They're getting a little physical. They shouldn't do something like that. Well, this was the Lord being merciful to them, the verse said. Did you see that? In verse 16, it says, the Lord being merciful unto him they literally grabbed onto them and dragged them out of the city and put them out of the side of the city in verse 18 or verse 17 they said when they had gotten them out there they said you need to escape for your life this is serious this is serious you escape for your life or you're not going to live go see that mountain over there you go to that mountain over there you don't stay in the plane here if you stay in the plane you'll be consumed with the city get out of here but then it's interesting because Lot says, well, not so. You've been merciful to me. And it seems to be that you're pleased to be gracious to me and saving my life and all this stuff. And that's great. But in verse, verse 20, he says, well, what about, what about this city? This city's close. Why, why can't I go there? Isn't this a little city? Well, you just let me, I mean, you've been real nice to me up to this point. What about this city over here? If I try to go to the mountain, I'm not going to make it. I, I'm not going to make it if I go to the mountain. Can I go to this city? And I almost, I almost wonder, you almost think about it, that the angels, in their mercy, in doing what they were doing, it's almost like Lot thought, well, they've been real nice to me, and maybe they're nice enough that they'll let me have my way. And they'll let me do what I want to do. And I almost get the feeling that Lot maybe didn't take this warning seriously because here's this little city that God's planning on destroying with the rest of the cities and Lot thinks I can go there and it's going to be okay and maybe if I go there none of this will happen and I'll just go away. Isn't this a little one? And he's literally arguing with God and his instructions. God said, escape, go to the mountain, don't look back. Lot argues with him. And the angel in his mercy let him but the point is, he argued to get what he wanted from God. And God allowed him to go there. And the Bible says, as soon as his foot crossed that line of the city limits in Zoar, the Lord reigned from heaven above brimstone and fire. Brimstone, it's volcanic rock. Massive, sulfuric, volcanic rock rock falling out of the sky like rain. A quiet morning back in Sodom. You have men, they're rebuilding. Remember Genesis 14, there was a conflict and they lost. And yet somehow by some miraculous provision, the people were saved. I wonder who did that for them. And his mercy. God did through Abraham. And they're rebuilding. And it's just another day. Life's going on as normal. Lot's son-in-laws. Their life's going on as normal. Then all of a sudden there's a loud explosion in town. And then there's another one. And another one. And that home is leveled. And that bridge is taken out. And before you know it. just there, You can't even see the clarity. The, the clear blue sky. Because it's there, there are massive fiery volcanic rocks falling from the heavens. And it says in verse 25 that God himself totally overthrew those cities and all the plain everybody who lived there and everything that grew upon the ground he totally wiped it out because of their wickedness and Lot as soon as he was in this city it says his wife who may have been with Lot who may have been behind him who may have been following him in the general direction that God wanted them to go to save their lives. But her heart wasn't there. Her heart was there. 
And it's no wonder. I mean, her husband's the one who's going to argue with God's simple instructions to save his life. It's no wonder Lot, what, because of what Lot chose for his family. And she looks back and immediately she's a pillar of salt. I'm not going to try to explain how that exactly happened. But I know this. God said, you don't look back. You get out of there and you don't look back. And she looked back. You say, how could such a man treat such an evacuation like it was an undesirable eviction? That this evacuation, it was mocked by his family and only those under his roof were present to go and then he lingered and he argued with the escape plan and his wife disobeyed the instructions yet God in his mercy was evacuating it them and he's fighting them he's fighting them to stay in the very place his soul was vexed you say how foolish of him how foolish of him to treat and evac this evacuation notice this way how foolish of him to linger in the place that you would have, you've been warned would be destroyed. How foolish to experience the mercy of God and yet argue with his escape plan and expose your family continually to toxic and destructive places and be attached to such a temporary and wicked society. How foolish. Yeah, it is. How foolish to be a righteous man, vexed by the wickedness of a culture that will face God's certain fiery judgment and yet put down deep roots in that culture. To face hardships that should have gotten your attention that you're in the wrong place a long time ago and yet stay in the wrong place, Genesis 14. To always pay attention to things that only hurt your soul rather than help your walk with God. To love money so much that it infects your family with that noxious weed that grows from the root of all evil, the love of money. To forsake a righteous uncle, a righteous influence in your life because you're really fond of what you see in the, in the land of Sodom and the land of the world. To be so conformed to this world and its mentalities, even when the world and the whole thing will pass away. To ignore God's warnings, you say, how foolish. Yeah, you're right, it is. So why do righteous men let things happen to them like this and their families? It's a great question for all of us. Why do righteous men let this happen to them and their families? We're talking about righteous men. Now, follow me. We're talking about men who have accepted the invitation the invitation to eternal life. The invitation to the Son of God. The invitation that as they live it out its truths and live out its promises and its principles. The invitation that both gives them good things for now and the life that is to come. We're talking about men who've accepted the invitation. Men who would sing, I feel like traveling on. Yes, I feel like traveling on. My heavenly home is bright and fair. I feel like traveling on. And songs such as that, that I can't feel at home here. And this world is not my home I'm just a passing through we're talking about men like that who would say on a Sunday that I'm looking amen I'm looking for a new heaven and I'm looking for a new earth wherein dwells righteousness and yet men who God is mercifully warning them and warning them and warning them giving them evacuation notices and even forcibly evicting them th from things in their life that has them entrenched in this world and its ways say well, what are some of those evacuation notices? Paul said, be not conformed to this world. He told the church in Corinth, and you don't have to go over there. I'm going to go, there. if you want to, you can. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Go there if you want to. The church in Corinth was a, a church that looked more like the world and their attitudes and their actions than they looked like Jesus. And, and Paul warned them the fashion of this world passes away. Well, you say, well, I, don't, I, 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 don't, I didn't have any warning to get to where I am in life. In the mess of life that I'm in, I didn't have any warning for that. Well, the scriptures say that these Old Testament examples, they are your warning. Look at verse 11 of chapter 10. Paul said, now all these things happen unto them for in samples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. 
They're written for your warning. The end of the world is coming. And these things are written for you, so what are you to do with it? Wherefore, let him that thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. He, you, he that, like Lot, thinks everything's good as long as the economical T's are crossed and I's are dotted, we're good. But let him that thinketh he stands take heed lest he fall. Verse 13, there's no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. I mean, you're not the first one to encounter the pull of the world, the pull of the lust of the flesh on your life. But God is faithful no matter what temptation you're facing, no matter what difficulty you're facing. He won't suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but he'll, with the temptation, make a way to, does this sound familiar? To escape, to evacuate. You may be able to bear it. Go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. You say, well, God just hasn't been clear to me. He hasn't been clear to me what he expects from my life, what, what he expects in relation to this world. I, I mean, I, I get Lot got where he went, but is there any clear road markers, any clear guidelines, any clear guardrails? He says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. A lot of people want to jump straight to marriage with this, but this just mean in the normal course of your life that your life is hooked up with people who don't want to follow God like you. And they're your besties. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? Like Lot. What communion hath light with darkness? What concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? What agreement does the temple of God hath with idols? You're the temple of the living God. And he said he would dwell in you and walk in you and be your God and be your people. And so he says, come out from among them. Come out from among them, Lot, and be ye separate. And touch not, sounds like don't look back. Touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. You say, well, Jesus wouldn't be so adamant about this. Paul said in Galatians chapter 1 that Jesus gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world. In fact, Paul later in Galatians chapter 6, he would say this, he would say that the cross is what, by, I, will, I will not glory save in the cross of Jesus Christ in which I am crucified to the world and the world is crucified to me. The cross is your evacuation. That means this. There's no fellowship. You are to have no fellowship with darkness that put Jesus on the cross for you. That's Christian living one-on-one. If it put Jesus on the cross for you, you aren't to have anything to do with it. Nothing. That means the attitudes of this world, the actions of this world, you are to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, those lusts, those desires that pull at you, and you're like, ah, okay, but that leads down a path that leads to sin that ends in death, and Jesus died to save you from that path. You're a pilgrim passing through a stranger, a sojourner. You don't belong here. And you're called to abstain from fleshly lusts which war against your soul. How foolish would you have to be to ignore the evacuation God is doing in your life? If you want to rename sanctification, call it God's daily evacuation plan for you. And how foolish to ignore God's evacuation in your life to get your heart out of this world and get it on him. How foolish to ignore that evacuation in your life and in the life of your family, men. You say, if Lot is a bad example of evacuating a place of divine judgment, what should I do? Well, if you went to the gospel, go to the gospel of Luke and you read about Jesus and talking about when the Son of Man comes and a number of things are going to happen. One, he's going to rescue us and we'll be finally and fully evacuated out of this broken, wicked world and he's going to judge the world. And he said, when that day comes, when the day of the Son of Man comes, the men of this world, it's going to be like the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. And people will be making their lunch 
and people will be building their houses and people will be making their plans and Jesus is going to take them all by surprise. And he said the attitude that should characterize his disciples is one of expectancy, awaiting for him to come. And, and if a man's on the housetop doing some business and he's a disciple, he's to leave everything behind and he is to be ready when his Lord comes. And that's where Jesus said, Luke 17, 32, remember Lot's wife who looked back. Disciple, if you are doing anything else but anticipating Christ's return for you, if you are looking back at anything, you're not following Christ. And you will be evacuated, you will be saved. But like Paul said, yet so is by fire. Lot's life, he was salvaged, but it was too late for his life not to be a royal mess say, so what can I do? And flip back to Genesis. I'll leave on a high note so we don't stay in the low notes here. Genesis 19 and 27, it says that Abraham got up early in the morning. Verse 27, he got up early in the morning and he went and he stood where he stood before the Lord the day before. And he looked all the way toward Sodom and billowing toward the sky smoke like the smoke of a giant furnace a sobering moment for Abraham wasn't it he was interested in what God was doing even though it hurt him and pained him what was going on he was in communion with God was aware of what God was doing look at verse 29 what does it say and it came to pass when God destroyed those cities of the plain. You know why God evacuated Lot? It says God remembered Abraham. You say, I have no intention to be a Lot. And you don't have to be. If you will be like Abraham and live the life of faith that he had been living in this time and open your life wide open to God and your interest is God and you are in tune with God and you are communing with God, your life can have a marked influence on others that is lasting. But it's up to you. Maybe God is doing a work in your heart tonight and saying evacuate, evacuate, teenager, evacuate, young adult, evacuate, older man, you've been saved a long time, but God is poking at an area in your life and he's saying you better get yourself out of that and you better get yourself out of it right now, you better do it. Don't make God forcibly evict you. But if you're like Abraham, keep getting up in the morning and even when the signs are there that others' lives are a mess, you can still commune with God. And God knows right where you are. And where you are still influences those who God is trying to evacuate. If you bow your head and close.